Hey, and, and yeah, absolutely. I'm, I mean, I'm sitting in my car, but uh, we, we can go off ca on camera as well for sure. I was going to actually put a, a, a note out to the group as a whole. I mean, we tried doing an in-person session uh, last fall, I think, and and <laughs> I think we had about 20 extra large pizzas and about 10 people. <laughs> it was not not well attended from that point of view. We decided to go back to the virtual, but I, you know, I'm curious if people are ready to head down. I mean, the Microsoft Canada offices are a beautiful spot to to do events. Maybe not every month but you know like once a quarter or something like that I mean, roy i haven't even talked with you about this uh what's your thoughts Roy, uh, you don't appear to be on mute but i can't hear you my uh it works device. now you're, you're kind my of device now. settings okay okay i just have to um with device settings. OK, cool, cool. So yeah, um, I'm more in tune with uh, in, in person, um, you know, maybe 50 50 to start off um, or around that around there. Uh, when I talk to other uh, meetup organizers, uh, some of them are like they just can't. They just don't like the whole uh, virtual thing. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, but yeah, that, that's some that's some people, you know, um uh i virtual is good you know just because uh it's it has its conveniences you know what i mean like hitting downtown is a bit tricky and tough sometimes um but uh i you know just uh it's you know, so nice to actually uh, physically get together with people I, I agree and and i saw your plus one there dennis thank you in fact anybody that's on the call hop on the chat if you think this is an interesting idea like just give a thumbs up like to to dennis's plus one and that'll be our informal poll to see you know how many people are keen and, and interested in from that point of view i mean there was a quite a good crowd at the uh at the ai day at, at the end of uh august so mm -hmm. i think I don't know what the exact numbers that Hineal had there, but it was a couple hundred at least. So it was a good showing from mm -hmm. that point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I think, you know, with the whole uh, back to uh, office push, I, I'm sure there's more people downtown. When last fall, it was still very much like work from home mode for most organizations. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Well, in terms of general things going on, like I've kind of been out of touch with the, some of the events that are happening. Like there is, there is an actual ignite in the in the queue, isn't there? Like a a real in person one coming up. Does anybody know much about that? Yeah, Peter, it's, it's in Seattle November. Only? Oh, so it's not that far away. Isn't it Seattle only, or I'm not sure. Or is it? Yeah, the SharePoint conference is next spring. Yes. And the Ignite is in Seattle. And, and is it a like old school 25,000 people expected kind of Ignite or is it a viewing party I haven't looked like they at had it. the last one? I haven't looked at it. They did mention it yesterday on the call. Okay. What, uh, I, I don't think I'm going to make it, but uh, what are the dates in November for that? So 14th and through 17. Yeah, somewhere okay. in there. Interesting. Cool. It also has Anybody, an online uh, part of it too. So. Right. So it'll be a hybrid event. Yeah, I think an Antonio from Protivity went to last year's Ignite, and uh, and he said it was a bizarre experience because it's you know this small group of people just sitting around TVs watching the event. It's like, why did I come here? I didn't get to meet any of the speakers. There was no conversations. So hopefully it's mm -hmm. it's more than that. So Bill, you often uh, give us sort of updates what's happening uh, from the development community and SPFX and and that side of the house. Do you want to take a couple minutes for a refresher there? Yeah, SPFX is now at. We're at uh, 1.18, released a couple weeks ago. Um, biggest thing, I guess, for anybody to know, it, it isn't obvious, it's off of a call today with Andrew Conhol, is uh, they now support Node 18, seeing how Node 16 is no longer in support. <laughs> so they just moved it. It will work with both Node 
16 and node 18 from what I understand. So okay. Uh, the other big thing is there's one, the um, oh one of the the pieces the frameworks that they use has been upgraded and uh, fabric stuff, and because it's made me some gotchas with that because of the change. Uh, but most of the new stuff in it is more tied to the new templating for um, Viva adaptive cards. Huh. So adaptive right. cards is really where they're putting all their time. And then the new version, next version is expected to have more of that in it. So, but nothing okay. should be expected till the new year on it. Interesting. Any uh, any other news or updates, either Bill or, or others? Nothing I've heard on the top of, off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I saw a funny post today, so I'm heading to Amsterdam in uh, November for ESPC and and they've been going through a rebranding exercise because they've been European SharePoint conference forever and you know it's not really just SharePoint focus anymore and they had this long name that included Office 365 and all this other stuff and they said, okay, the big reveal of our new brand is we're now just ESPC. You know, it's not European SharePoint conference or anything else, it's just those four letters ESPC. So. Yeah, SharePoint is, is still very much front and center out there, and, and there's definitely some brand equity from that point of view. Well, Dennis, should we uh, turn the floor over to you and, and we can compare notes? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll share my screen. I, I'm actually not going to be able to stay for this, the whole session, so don't feel pressure. Just like do your thing and, uh, and maybe we can catch up afterwards and, and compare as well. That would be cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I'm super curious what you uh, already know and what you collected. Just a quick note, Peter. I got to reach out to give you a call. I'll email you. Okay. okay. And, and we've got uh, seven, eight, nine on the, uh, yeah, we should do it in person. So we're almost at the 10 that we had in person last time. We should definitely queue it up again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. Um, if there is nothing else, I'll, uh, I'll kick it off. The um, today's topic is SharePoint and cognitive search. Uh, my name is Dennis Molotsov. I I've been working with SharePoint, Microsoft 365, and uh, the Power Platform for many years. I've implemented over a hundred highly customized projects. Uh, either completely alone or part of a team. I live uh, here in Toronto, uh, Canada. And uh, today I want to show you how hopefully relatively easily you can get your corporate chat GPT that is context aware. It knows where you work and it has access to some of your documentation. Uh, before I jump into the weeds, I want to just show you right away how it looks. It's hosted in Azure as a web service. Uh, in terms of branding, you can change all of it, but uh, just for the sake of uh, simplicity, I left it uh, untouched. So here I can ask basic questions, for example, uh, what is our company? For example, maybe I'm new. Maybe I don't know what where I even work. It'll uh, say that our company's uh, Tailspin. This is a fictitious name I picked. And for all sorts of answers, the AI here will provide me the references. Uh, I can click on them here on an on a side panel. It'll show as such. Okay, so before maybe jumping into showing everything, I want to explain that there are lots of lots of competitors, and this particular implementation is just one of the many. 
one of the things you probably heard of is uh, Bing Chat Enterprise, which I believe currently is in preview and might be included in most Microsoft 365 um, subscriptions, including E3, E5, and uh, the business. You can also purchase it purchase it as a standalone and I believe it costs about five dollars US per user per month. So sounds like a good deal. Uh, I haven't tried it yet, but I believe it also has some access to to your corporate data. So definitely worth a try. Um, Dennis, uh, mm -hmm. I, I did dig into Bing Chat Enterprise a bit and, and I was hoping the same thing because when you do a search in Bing, enterprise it searches your corporate data but when you do chats mm -hmm. the chats are private so they don't go into the model and nobody else sees the data but the the large language model can't see your corporate data as part of that mm -hmm. i mean that's where what you're i think right. going to show us brings yeah that in. yeah okay that makes sense why it's free or very cheap because yes. the <laughs> the other option i i was hoping to mention is the i believe it's probably called enterprise copilot if I'm not mistaken, that one costs $30 per month per person. And, th and that one definitely can be connected to the enterprise. Data set. Yeah, through graph. And that's... Okay. Uh, I haven't played with that one or looked at that one, so I don't mm -hmm. know that. But yeah, it, that's not cheap, though. I mean, that adds up. No, got... for a company of 100, that's like $3,000 $3, per US per, per month. Mm -hmm. I. I'm yeah. not even sure. Definitely, the <laughs> that's one of the reasons you want to start with something like this. If you're very careful and uh, not like if you are not worried about shutting it down and recreating, you might almost get it for free, just at least as a test. That's what I, I've been doing. Uh, th this basic implementation <laughs> costs at least about three hundred. Twenty dollars per month, but because you pay per hour of the cognitive search, I was shutting it down whenever it's not used, and I can re-implement it within maybe ten minutes, and uh, thus I, I saved lots of money <laughs> while researching this. Now you also pay per transaction with the the. Azure AI, right? And and that can um, get quite expensive. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So like we'll we'll talk about the costs Sorry, I, at, I, I at the end. <laughs> no, no, it's it's okay. Uh so in terms of the costs, you you pay for at least three main components: the cognitive search, AI, and website. So the website can be shut down maybe at nights or you can switch the, the t, uh, plan to a free plan at night. You right. can thus save like 50%. But if it starts with like about $17 Canadian per month. That's not like for the, for the entire the company. One, yeah. yeah, AI, it's pretty much zero when it's not used. Once it's right. used though, you can, you can spend tons of money. I definitely, know that I, I use it myself and I <laughs> I there were quite a few times I spent 150 bucks in a day easily if I yeah. if I'm not careful but again uh, if you're careful like zero is your starting price only pay when you're using it Co right. cognitive search is the only annoying part that you cannot shut it down you cannot switch the tier to a free one it just like constantly charges you every hour, like less than a dollar per hour, like it's like thirty cents per hour or something, maybe sixty. But uh, that's that's kind of the, the main the main clock, part. Yeah. yeah, that's the main part. I part I paid for. So, right. But but it's so easy to shut it to to shut it down and then recreate it. I have been doing that. Right. Um, you don't need to be a data scientist or a machine learning or AI expert to uh, do something like I'm going to show you today, uh, but it helps to know some basics, of course, especially if you worked or just, you know, 
deployed once um, a model in Azure OpenAI or just in OpenAI, that will help you a lot. But that's strictly speaking, it's not necessary. Uh, it helps if you know SharePoint a little bit, basically just doc documents libraries. Uh, other SharePoint related so skills are you know, not necessary. You just need to know how to create custom columns and columns upload and documents columns and, upload and uh, documents. populate yeah. values. Uh, it helps if you know what Azure app registrations are how to create them and how to apply permissions to them. Um, also, it's it's a great help if it, not necessary, but if you know how uh, web services or websites hosted on Azure work, and that, that's great, particularly useful if you know where the config is to change some things. And uh, one of the like most unfortunate things in this uh, sample is that because SharePoint as is, is a data source is in preview. The only way today you can create it is through a REST API. So that's kind of the biggest hurdle. But hopefully, if you're interested, I'll show you that, that it's not that difficult. But if you never worked with REST API as a consumer, then it might be a bit of a challenge. Uh, in terms of the chat bot architecture, today the most basic one is here. I'll go over each component separately, but SharePoint is the main data source, or the only data source for that matter today. Cognitive search is going to crawl or index uh, the content, the data source. OpenAI will use in turn um, cognitive search through an API. And then user, it's not visible here, but imagine it's you as a user or person. You'll open a website and start chatting with it, um, and OpenAI will reply. So the main window for a user like where you type is basically here. Cosmos DB is optional. It's uh, for storing recent chat history for your session. It's not very expensive though, so no point uh, like not using it. So um, no need to remember that. We'll go slowly each point by one by one. The first point is SharePoint as a data source. Uh, in my case, we have approximately 50 documents. Not a lot, but as a start, it's, uh, it's, a, it's quite useful for, for this demo. I have mostly security-related documents related to Tailspin Company. I have HR documents. I have some company trivia. Uh, for example, address, uh, the, the, the legal name, emails, uh, emergency contacts, maybe something related to the premises, uh, etc. So that um, that <laughs> actually that took me several days to to generate uh, and prepare because it's not easy to find good sample data. I, I'll be honest with you because I tried most of these things before, or all of them actually, uh, getting data was the biggest time waster for me, not the implementation. So hopefully for uh, for you, it uh, it's it's a good sign. Uh, I for the data source, I recommend a few improvements. By the way, I'll, I'll show you how the library works. So that's how it looks. Nothing unusual. Uh, you can put everything flat in a single folder, or you can split it or spread your documents in subfolders. It doesn't matter. It'll work either way. Also, if you are curious, yes, you can have more than one library. You can have as many as you want. Uh, but in this case, we, we just have one. 
maybe you already notice here, but I have a bunch of custom metadata. I created it on purpose as an experiment to confirm if AI is aware of this. Like, can I make it make sure it knows uh, like search crawls this or indexes this information? And AI also can utilize this. And I also recommend using your custom metadata. It, just uploading documents with no context is, is going to work, but the more metadata, the better, my opinion. Another thing I discovered is that for some reason, AI uh, in, in this configuration is not really aware how to get to the original file path. So as a workaround, I'm helping it a little bit by creating a custom field. In each field, I put a full path to, to the document. It's a bit redundant and it, it, it might require some manual work or you might need to create a flow that automatically populates it. But that's something that I had to do. If somebody on the call knows another way around this, uh, please let me know. But that's that that was helpful for my, my case. Um, Dennis, mm -hmm. question. So the reason for not getting the full path is because of the REST API limitation? Uh, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll show you um, if you give me 10 seconds. I will jump a little bit to the next step. It's cognitive search. So the cognitive search already has a data source, SharePoint. Um, it has an indexer, which basically crawls data source. And I have the index. Well, now it's just one index. If I look into it and start, you know, asking, let's say just I'll ask, get get me everything you can. And if I look into the path here, where is the path here? So this is a path that you probably recognize as a graph API kind of path. So if I get this and try opening, I might, it probably not, it won't work, but the point is this is a graph API path. I, without a graph API, a user cannot really open this URL. And I don't really have a means of easily converting this graph API, sorry, graph API based URL to a, a SharePoint um, path. So if you look a little bit lower, you'll see my custom field here. And this one is more user friendly. This one actually works if I open it directly in the browser like this. Oops, I misspelled it. But yeah, I, I'm not going to open it, but it, it will open. So if again, if you think I I maybe made a mistake and it's a redundant work, and somehow I can use this one, let me know, but I, I, I couldn't figure it out. Uh, the reason I ask is you mentioned we're knowing REST API in the earlier slides. And mm -hmm. The the like when I did something with SharePoint and Azure like uh, pipeline AD pipeline, I found the limitations in SharePoint REST API and then find more mm -hmm. data coming through Graph API. You know some metadata were not coming through SharePoint REST API, but they were coming through Graph mm -hmm. API. So that was the like my point in saying mm -hmm. that can you leverage Graph API? rather than SharePoint REST API. Um, so let me, I'll answer this question in a second. So just to show you where we are. So we covered this point. Now we're talking about the cognitive search. Uh, just for everyone on the call, I want to cover some basics of what cognitive search is. It's not, a by far not the full list, but this is something we use. Uh, if you want, if you know, maybe if you have experience with SharePoint search, I'll use the same analogy and I'll use the database analogy for just to help. 
So indexes, it's going to be SQL anal uh, analogy here and the SharePoint search analogy here. Search. So in terms of SharePoint search, an index is a search scheme. In terms of SQL, you can treat index as a, a SQL table if it helps you. Uh, SQL table has columns, search schema has uh, managed and crawled properties, same thing. Data source is, well, um, maybe not necessarily, yeah, it's true across everything. Uh, SharePoint search mostly can crawl SharePoint. It can also crawl all sorts of things, but ma mainly SharePoint lists and libraries. Um, an indexer basically is a search uh, crawler, or in SQL, it could be a SQL job, doesn't matter. So the indexer reaches out to a data source, grabs data, and saves it to the index. So if you, if you like the SQL analogy, like some kind of a job, reads uh, a data and just saves it back in a table. That's all it is. Uh, to show you a demo, we'll go back here. So you have all sorts of things that cog uh, cognitive search can do. It's a, it's a beast. It's quite powerful, but we'll just talk about these three. The main thing we need to start with is the data source. Uh, one of the problems with this demo is that SharePoint is not yet available for you to create uh, through UI. This is why I mentioned REST API. Uh, uh, when I mentioned REST API, I didn't mean SharePoint REST API. I meant basically you need to send a, a REST query to your cognitive search service to create here a SharePoint uh, data source. It's in preview. Hopefully one day it's going to be a legitimate data source and it'll appear here. But so far there was no concrete promise that it will ever happen. I'll, I'll explain later there is a workaround. So even if it never happens, it's, I honestly think it's not a big deal at all. Um, to, oh, by the way, does that, uh, Kavita, does that um, answer your question? Uh, yeah, kind of. So when you say you're providing REST API, not necessarily SharePoint REST API. Mm -hmm. So what kind of uh, REST API URL you're providing? So let me, so I, the first step is to create a data source in, mm. so that uh, cognitive search knows what, like sees the data it needs to crawl. To do it, you need to use a REST API. Uh, I, in this case, I use Postman, but I, I believe it's one of the easiest way to send requests, but you can use curl or PowerShell or, Python. There is also no SDK yet for to create a cognitive search uh, data source. So that's another reason you, you want to use REST API. So this is the request you need to send. This is your, actually, maybe I'll show here. It's easier. This is the full URL that I need to use to send a, a host query. This is my service name. It's unique to, to me. And uh, this is an API version. I also have an API key that's for the cognitive search. Don't try it, it's not gonna work anyway. So it's a fake one. And in the body, I specify a JSON. In this JSON, I say what connection string uh, for SharePoint is basically it's just a SharePoint site, but application IDs and application secret, which of course not going to work. Don't try. 
and a tenant ID. So I just need to send this JSON to this address, and that's it. Okay, got I it. I hope yeah. it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, does it. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's a community search REST API. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep, yep. I think uh, I can uh, send as a test a... I never tried it before this uh, call. I never tried creating two data sources, but I can try right now while you're here. So if I give it a different name, maybe call it demo data source and click send. Fingers crossed it'll work. So if I go check here, refresh the page, and it should hopefully show a second data source. There you go. So that's uh, that's the only reason you need this uh, postman. For indexes and indexers, same same story. Uh, to create an index, um, you could, in theory, do it manually, and I tried, and I honestly do not recommend. It's really a pain in the neck, and one of the problems is that you might need to recreate them several times if you create them incorrectly. So same thing here. I have a post uh, query to make to create an index. In here, you could. So, by the way, this is not something I came up with. This is from the documentation. I'll uh, show you, or maybe in the chat, I'll send you a link in a second. Well, these are all default list uh, fields. At the bottom, however, I specified a bunch of custom fields. These are basically the same names as SharePoint fields. And while doing this, I, I made possible for the indexer to see these and crawl them. One of them, as you can see, is a full path. Uh, this entire, if you're familiar with Postman, uh, I save this entire uh, collection as a file, and I'll make it available in the chat in a second. So you can import it if you want. Here. So it, you just uh, download this file and go to Postman and import it, and you'll basically get this entire thing here. The only preparation you'll have to do is if you click on your collection and go variables, you need to specify a bunch of things, like a, uh, a key, application ID, and so on. But uh, here in the chat, you'll get it. There you go. And for the article, since I just promised, let me. So if you, I only needed two articles. So uh, after reading these two, I everything worked like magic. So I'll send these two articles. That's the first one, and that's the second one. So the the first article I, I shared is basically a tutorial on how to use Postman to connect to cognitive search service. Very useful. I used it and it made my life way easier. And the second article is basically the whole purpose. The, the, the first article teaches you how to use Postman. And the second article assumes that you already know how to use it and says, OK, now create a data source, a SharePoint data source using requests. And as I mentioned, I you probably saw JSON, which looked cryptic or complicated. I just copy pasted it. I copy pasted it, copied and pasted it from here like this and modified some portions of it as they explained here very well, by the way. Uh, same thing for data source. I only needed to send three requests, create a data source, create an index, and create an indexer. Indexer is a job that basically does something. It uh, crawls data and saves it to a database. 
Uh, any questions so far? This is the most confusing part, by the way, so I get it. Maybe to stop uh, here a little bit, I, I want to show that Cognitive Search is a service that doesn't have a user interface. That's maybe something that you might not realize. You only use it as a proxy, like it's a service for that enables your website, your application to search. So while we are like we have a data source, we have a search service, but there is no website yet that you cannot interact with it, except there is a, a search explorer. That's the only place where you can check how it works. You can use uh, some search terms, filters and, and such, and see what your results will look like. As you can see, they appear in a JSON format. You can see, uh, metadata that was that was indexed. You can see custom fields here, which is amazing. I love it. And one of the interesting fields here is a content. If you keep scrolling, you'll see how big it is, but it's not infinite. The content field is limited. It's not. Um, the, I think you can tweak how big it can be, but it's really more or less about a page worth of text that's kind of important later so if you have a hundred page document this is a limitation where it, it, it might bite you there are some workarounds how to deal with this but for this demo you can uh, assume that we're only crawling or indexing the first page of each document so yeah any uh Raj Kumar, uh, question? Yes. question. Mm -hmm. uh, will this work for uh, if we give a source like a SharePoint hub or anything where we can have multiple sites in there? Uh, good question. Uh, I not. I tried to find in the documentation how to crawl more than one site. I couldn't figure it out, but uh, there might be a way. That's the, that's the only thing I can say. Uh, okay. Yeah, there might be a way. So create data source. So in their in their documentation, they kind of suggest that it might be possible, but but they don't show the syntax of doing this. So I I, I don't know. Yeah. And Dennis, you mentioned hmm. it will crawl only first page of the document. In this sample, yes. Uh, but you specified that as a parameter or some setting yeah there is a like a maximum tokens or maximum like i think it's called maximum size or maximum tokens mm -hmm. it, 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 yeah i'll show you but it's also as a parameter you can you can tweak uh we're still here but next uh when we sh when i i, I explain the a open ai portion i'll show you where this setting is okay Actually, yeah, it's probably it's going to be too late for the crawling. Uh, let me see. Yeah, yeah, you know what? Take my words back. I think that's that's where you can do it. I don't. I don't think I. Yeah, max fail. There's like a max something batch size. Yeah, there are some some parameters. As you can see, I don't use them. But I was on a call with uh, Roy, Roy Kim, yesterday, and he had samples with quite large documents. And for him, he had to, Roy, you, you had to tweak. We, we bumped up one of these settings so that it worked. But I, as you can yeah. see, it's, it's a basically default here. I'm not changing anything here. I hope that that answers it. OK, so let me see where we are here. Yeah, the cognitive search pricing, because it's such an expensive thing. I, I just wanted to spend a second here. 
uh, the f you might notice that there is a free cognitive search offering and basic. Basic costs about 100 Canadian per month and free is 100. And I was able to use free and it was working quite well, but uh, you'll learn later the limitation here uh, is uh, that you can only connect these uh, cognitive uh, cognitive search tiers to open AI. And these these cannot be connected. That's one of the one of the reasons you, you need to prepare some <laughs> some budget for, for this uh, implementation. So th don't kind of waste your time. You you can try these, but you're not going to make it. You, you're not going to create a chat that uses these, at least not easily. Postman, I already talked a little bit about this uh, in terms of a demo. You saw it, but I might need to share with you the link how to download it. Let me send it to you. It's free. Uh, of course, there is a paid version and it's quite an amazing product, to be honest with you. But for our purposes, you just need a free basic version. It works very well. Search limitations, I touched on that already, but uh, I, I really need to stress it. SharePoint data sources in preview and Microsoft in their documentation highlighted and they say, please do not use it for production or use it at, on the, at your own risk. They might mm, end up removing it. So. There is a workaround, of course, not to worry, but just to, just to be clear here, it's in preview. Uh, you need to use REST API, yeah? Uh, Hi, sorry, just one question. Like, does this uh, work with the existing SharePoint permissions? Like, or will the users be able to search everything? Good question. So you're asking if it's uh, security trimmed if That's SharePoint, right. no, it's it's not security trimmed, but by default, at least you could probably create your custom field uh, and then store like a security permission matrix, which will probably be very complex. But by default, it's not happening. Uh, we right. assume that only like for this demo, we assume it's internal documents that are available for to everyone in the company that are crawled. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, I mentioned earlier, REST API is the only way to create a, a SharePoint data source. So that's a bit of a hurdle. Uh, also, you some person asked me on LinkedIn a, a week ago uh, if it's possible to crawl SharePoint pages. No, not di directly. There are, again, some workarounds, but not directly. You might have hundreds of uh, knowledge base articles written in SharePoint using mo modern pages or classic pages. These have to be somehow converted to something else to be uh, indexed. And also, just for this demo, assume only the first pages is indexed. Uh, supported document types. There's a big list, but very simply, things like text, CSV, HTML, office files, uh, no images. Uh, but there are again some caveats. If it's an image inside a Word document, there is a way to to index them. It's outside of this this today's scope, but there is a way to do this. By the way, zip files, interestingly enough, are, can be indexed. Quite interesting. OK, so now let's go to the probably the most interesting part. It's not the most difficult part by any stretch of the imagination, but that's kind of the the where it connects everything together. AI.
I already created an OpenAI uh, service. If you want to create it in your tenant, you probably will need to get approved. When you request it to be created, you'll need to fill out a form and hopefully within a day or maybe a week or two, you get an approval and you can use it. Uh, we are, like I'm in Canada and my uh, region is Canadian. Maybe that's the reason I wasn't approved to 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 be uh, to use chat GPT four, so I'm I'm just using GPT three point five, which is good enough. Plus plus it's much cheaper. So don't uh, if you assume that chat GPT four is uh is worth it, you you uh, you might be wrong because in many cases you'll just end up paying like ten times more. Uh, while getting almost exactly the same answers. So I'm not too worried about not using it yet. So in if you saw it, this uh, it's great. It's a chat uh, playground. If you haven't, basically it's your debug and testing area for AI models. I already have a few deployments. Uh, this is a very old deployment I use for other purposes, but I deploy, deployed a GPT 3.5 Turbo 16K. 16K is for, uh, it, it denotes number of maximum tokens I can use. 16,000 is actually quite a lot, which, which is great. And uh, I'll select a 3.5 model here and here I can start chatting with it and I can start asking questions as in the sandbox. For example, I can ask uh, where what is, what is our address? Sorry, but I am just a an AI model. I don't know anything. I don't know where you work. I don't know what you want from me. This is a stupid question. So it doesn't know where it doesn't. Mm, it's not yet connected to a data source, right? So we need to connect it. Uh, we like we have AI, but it's not yet like connected to anything. So I'm show you how to to make this connection right now. So while you're here, click on data source, add your data, add a data source. And in here, it's fairly straightforward. You just pick uh, options in the drop down. Select a data source. You might notice that you also have a blob storage. And if you're super kind of, you want a super quick demo, you can even upload the files directly here. No cognitive search required. But at the same time, this is like not super great. This option is very limited. What we're going to use is Azure Cognitive Search, which we had set up earlier in like five, 10 minutes ago. Select a subscription, Cognitive Service. I have two, but I'll select this one. And I'll select an index. I only have one, so select that one. Um, by the way, if somebody um, knows why, it's interesting it doesn't suggest a, a, a vector option here, which is, uh, I th I'm sure there is a way to enable it for SharePoint as a data source, but like I'm curious why it's grayed out here. I couldn't figure it out. Next, uh, I need to map the fields. AI wants to know where in search, in the search index, it, it, content is stored. It's, it's indeed in the content field. Where the file name is, it's uh, in item name here. Title is stored in title. And URL, by the way, uh, you could select a path here. Um, but as I mentioned, it's just a graph, graph, uh, how it's called, like driver, a endpoint. I honestly think it's kind of useless because you cannot use this to to give a link to a user. This is why I use my custom field here. Full file path. You probably saw it half an hour ago. 
and then click next search type. Um, this is uh, keyword is something that I use uh, right now and it's at no extra cost. Semantic search is way better, but it costs extra money, unfortunately. I'll explain maybe if we have time what semantic search and how it is better than keyword, but I'm not using it right now. And then click save. And now if I clear the chat and ask the same question, what is our um like okay, what what is our address, let's say? It should hopefully answer. Um I <laughs> okay, what is our company called? Okay, I'm not sure why it couldn't get the address, but okay, it's not perfect. Uh, the company's called Tailspin Incorporated. It it shows me onboarding guide and the company information, which is very good actually. And click on it, read it. Oh, interesting. And I can control whether I want to use uh, my data or not with this checkbox. And of course I want it. <laughs> and also it's not necessary strictly speaking, but you can modify a system message to say, to instruct AI to behave in a certain manner, use a certain language. For example, you are an AI assistant uh, for tail spin for the tail spin company that helps the tail spin members find the relevant information. You can expand it, but the point is it kind of it helps. It, it, it this context helps. Also, if you want, you can provide a few examples. Uh, I'm not sure has been added. Yeah, so for the. For this case, it's grayed out for some reason, but. Would be a way to provide some uh, few shot examples. Few shot examples means that you give a, you ask a question and you answer it in the way that you think is best. You just give a few answers to help AI understand what kind of style you want it to use in the answers. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Like you are. We are almost done here. Now we establish this connection. And we can now jump right away, right from here to this step, which is basically a web creating a website. To do that, uh, there is a button here, deploy to. If I click it, I can deploy to a Power virtual agent, which seems to me like cost a lot of money. So I haven't even tried it. I don't have a few hundred bucks uh, I, I could use for this, but we'll deploy it as a total website. So if I click this button, I can create create a new app or I can redeploy an existing one. So let's create a new app. I'll uh, give it a name like tail spin chatbot subscription uh, resource group like a container where in Azure this website will be located doesn't matter what I choose here location I just in case I, I select a, 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 the US region but I don't think it matters much pricing plan uh, you can actually, this is interesting, but you can even select a free one. But it'll only work for 60 minutes per day. And also, if you try opening it, it might take like a minute to warm up. But you can start with B1. It's not expensive at all. It's like $16 per month. Enable chat history. So if you check this checkbox, a, a, a Cosmos DB will be provisioned. And it also costs, I think, $17, $18 per month, not super expensive. 
You also need to acknowledge disclaimers and click deploy. Deployment takes between a minute and maybe 10 minutes. And then I'm not going to deploy it right now because I already have a website here. But when it's deployed, you'll get this. You can, you can now chat with your site. And you can ask uh, all sorts of questions. For example, this is our public website. Public website for Tailspin is www.tailspin.com. It gives me the references. Um, what are my dental benefits? For dental benefits, 100% covered. Uh, for the preventative care and $1,500 per year. Fillings, crowns, a reference here. If you're curious, we um, when we had a mapping, when we were connecting AI to a data source, it asks us for full mapping questions, uh, a title, uh, content field, and hyperlink. So title goes here. So uh, links to documents, I'll. I'll try showing you to me, but give me 10 hyperlinks to policies. Let me see if that works. Because you probably want to get clickable links to your documents. And this is this is how it does it here. Right? So I hope it makes sense. Without creating that custom field and populating it, th this just didn't work. So now I can click on them and they 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 should open or get downloaded, which is really nice. Hey Dennis, mm -hmm. hey Dennis, I got a question. So, like, if you're uh, like prompted like. Um, uh, a question like, uh, you know, what is um, Microsoft's HR policies, right? Like, basically, you're asking something that's out of bounds of the, your data source. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I wonder, like, if it does that because mm, I don't think it will because I had to mark a checkbox where it says use your your corporate data source. Oh, okay, good. As good, a good. result, you can yeah. trick it. You can trick it. Yeah, you can trick it and it'll go like beyond like my data source. But it, yeah. as soon as soon as it senses that you're kind of out of scope of the data source, it, it mm -hmm. doesn't want to answer it. Mm -hmm. If you okay. frame your question in a tricky way to trick it into answering it. Yeah, you know, okay. that, for example, it like what is one plus one? It I think it won't even try. Or if you ask like, um, why is mm -hmm. you know what? Why is the uh, sky blue or something? Same thing, yeah. But again, yeah. it can answer what is one plus one in a context of uh, of your like if your documents of, yeah. of your documents, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. No, that's that's mm -hmm. good. And um, okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see. So and the chat history is like the. So now we deploy the website, click the button to do that. And we also check the checkbox to say we want the chat history. And we got a database created. I think even without the chat history, it works OK. It's optional. But again, it's so cheap, you might also might as well get it. Oh, where are we here? Limitations. Yeah. Uh, you probably noticed how I said I got 50 documents and you're probably wondering, oh, my company has half a million documents. Will it work well with half a million or even a thousand? So my answer is no. It's uh, even with these 50 documents, it's already struggling to, to find the re relevant paragraph find even the relevant document. By default, it kind of tries to look through five documents only. I increased it to 50. 
as as a maximum, just to so that it's it has wider scope. But but even fifty is not that many. So there are some workarounds, and they're beyond the scope. But there are some things like chunking and a vector databases that solve these problems, at least partially. You're not going to be able to ask questions about a million documents, but certainly it's going to be way more than just 50. Um, in terms of price, like how much do you think you will have to pay for all of this goodness? Uh, you could approximately, of course, every company is different. You might have 50 people or 100,000. And uh, this is just an average budget for a company with maybe like 100 people or so. So prepare about $1,000 per month. Where does this price originate from? The most expensive part is cognitive AI. And depending on which features you enable, it can go even higher. It can go to a, th a few thousand per, per month. If you use AI, if you use uh, semantic search, if you if you want more storage, so this price can go even higher. AI, as I said, it could start with a zero, but if your chatbot becomes quite popular, uh, the AI service costs will, will will be quite high. So just be aware of that. The website and database charges will probably be quite low in comparison with these two guys. So this is not that expensive. So as you could see, it probably doesn't add up, add up to a thousand, as I mentioned here. But this is like the absolute minimums here, right? So account for more than a minimum. <laughs> I tried saving some costs uh, and it works 100%. So I can just go ahead and literally delete my cognitive search service. And using Postman, I can, I can create everything back within five minutes. And if I want to, I can even automate this so that it happens. Deletion happens at night, and in the morning, it's it's back on uh, back online. You can save at least maybe thirty percent, fifty percent. And uh, if if uh, this service is very expensive and you use lots of services there, it uh, it might worth it. Um, I probably criticized my own implementation here, but it's it's very basic, and I already knew that it would be. But the next step would is what can we do to make it better? Like, uh, how about a thousand documents, ten thousand documents? What if my documents on average have fifty pages instead of one? You know, what about semantic search? For example, if I'm searching for, uh, let's say, tree bark, it, it doesn't know that I mean the bark is a word meaning like to make noise or versus uh, like skin of a tree. It uses by default a, a cheaper version of keyword search. But I can use semantic search, which is free for up to a thousand queries per month, which is not a lot. Later, it, it's I think it's uh, 350 or so uh, dollars per month for some uh, the next year, and it can go even higher. You can also chunk your large documents. So if you have a document with 100 pages, you can chunk it, and each page or so will become a separate document, which will be separately stored and separately indexed. It's called chunking. Um, you can also, each chunk can be summarized as a text, 
or it can be summarized as so-called vectors, which is like again out of scope. But vectors is basically a language that machines understand. AI loves vectors versus words. So there is a way to make it way more efficient, fast, smarter this way. You can also use ChatGPT4 instead of 3.5 like I'm using. Uh, that's something we already did. I showed it to you, but you can change the system prompt. Don't use default to do, do, do something with it to say, this is a company such and such, and my goal is to provide information on security or HR related information or whatever. Just help it understand who it is or what it is. You can also increase the maximum number of tokens, file sizes. Uh, I actually forgot to show it, but uh, maybe if I go back for a second. Before deploying a website, there was a way for me to tweak some settings. So they are here in the parameters. The defaults are quite low. So max response is 800 tokens. So you can just bump it up quite a bit, especially if you're using a very cheap model. Like 3.5 is not that expensive. Uh, temperature you can reduce so that it might. I'm not sure if it controls hallucination directly, but if you want more predictability, you can even make it all like all the way to zero. Here is like more randomness. The P, I'm actually not sure what that means yet, so don't ask me. Uh, current token, there was a, yeah, honestly, that's one of the biggest here, like the, the tokens, maximum token size here. It'll help quite a bit because if you make it lower, you'll see your answers will be cut, cut out not complete. In terms of the uh, website settings, um, is it? Yeah, it's here. So I'm talking, so these settings you just saw, they were here. Now I'm, I'm showing you the settings for the website. There is a so-called uh, config or configuration file in here. You don't have to change them, but it's quite useful. Takes a minute to load. So you have quite a lot of settings, but I just wanted to point out a few. By the way, one of them is vector columns, so it does support vectors. Us, uh, that's great. I haven't tried it yet, but it's a, it's a great option if if that is possible. Search top K. So I believe this is how many documents ch the uh, chat will AI will crawl, like open one by one. By default, it's five. So I increased it to 50. And I think it you can't make it more than 50. So even if you make it here, I don't think it'll actually use that setting anymore. So other than that, like semantic search, you can enable it here, but again, it costs extra money. So I, I didn't use it yet. No, so that's something you could do here. In terms of the database, there is nothing I could find you could tweak or improve except for just shutting it down when you're not used. Okay. Uh, any questions so far? Uh, Dennis, question. Uh, can you only collect information about the, your company, or you also can ask to make some predictions based on the data? In SharePoint lists libraries. I think I, I could try. I think it should work. 
Uh, the problem is I don't have much statistical information. OK, let me try. Uh, we have a company dog, Lola. Lola. Uh, and you for just how many barks she will perform next year. Let me see if that works. Hmm. Uh, Maybe me. something like um, for policies documents that you previously requested. So you can ask, for example, um, based on amount number of policy documents, uh, what do you think? How many new policy documents will be generated next month in my company? Um, no, not like that. No, it doesn't really. I I can ask this question, but I'm sure it won't get it. It doesn't. It's missing this information. If I were to collect this, like some basic information, store it as a document, or if I push it to the index database of cognitive search, then it'll have this data. The, the reason I, I use the dog here because I know there is, an comp, there is an article about the dog here and it has some stats like barks per day. I, I was just going to how many barks per, per week all uh, can do. I was I'm just hoping it'll get it. If not, I'll be disappointed. Based on return, there is no specific number. OK, perfect. However, it's mentioned. Oh, OK. Mm. Yeah, it's a, it's a quite disappointing. Exact frequency per, per week is not provided. I mean, it, it knows per, how many barks per day it does. So it should should be able to tell that it's uh, 12.5 times 5 or times 7s, but it, it didn't even try. So I would say probably not a good fit, even if you implement chunking and and add extra a AI models and uh, factors, I don't think it'll work with predictions. Maybe if we use ChatGPT4, maybe it'll be smarter and do that, but this one is too dumb to do this, apparently. OK, thank you. Uh, Harsh, do you have a question? Yeah, hi. Uh, I just wanted to know about the Azure, uh, Azure app settings uh, for the, is it using delegated permissions or app permissions? Uh, uh, you can, great question. You can, mm -hmm. so, to I, I I hope I understand your question, but a um, cognitive search crawls SharePoint using an app registration. Right, right. Yeah, that's the one I was looking so for. So there are two options, two permission options. Uh, it needs Graph API uh, sites read all. I think I forgot how how it's called exactly and. And something else read all. I, I forget. basically this is the own oh, files. Yeah, files. Files read all. Again, probably misspelling it a little bit, but the point is there are two ways to give permissions. Is the first one is app only. App only and delegated. The interesting thing is both of them are supported. I'm using app only because I'm using a demo test tenant and uh, delegated is supported. In fact, in the article that I, I shared in the chat, for some reason they prefer it. And because of it, I've, uh, when you establish, when you recreate a data source, a SharePoint data source, you'll have to go to the UI of the cogn cognitive search and you need to click like, I accept these permissions. So you kind of see a pop-up window and you need to make sure you're signed in. 
and you need to make sure you kind of click I accept these permissions. So, so uh, that helps. Mm -hmm. it might help in the permissions, right? The I mean, trimming uh, tr the security trimming. I'm just wondering no, if delegated permissions. Yeah, I know what you mean, but it's it's not per person. It's for mm. basically it's just for this portion. Just for this portion. So if you're login, if you log in as a user to the website, your your permission, your context is not traveling all the way here. It's not delegated, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, it, it, so when when we use delegated permissions, you you use it just for one person. It's only for the indexing. One once it's indexed. Once all documents are indexed, they are indexed on behalf of that one person who used that delegated permission. And then every user then will see the same documents with no security trimming. So I see. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Anything else, guys? Any questions? I had a question around the, the site that they use to actually question the AI. Uh, I, I might have missed it. I got disconnected. But is mm -hmm. yeah, is this site publicly available where you have to sign in to use this? I think you could make it anonymous, but by default it uses the corporate of, uh, authentication, single sign-on. Okay, thanks. You can change it. If anyone interested, I think you might. If you're, if somebody decides for, uh, implemented for real in their company, you might want to check out. Oh, where is it? Sorry, could be one second. Yeah. Here. So this site we deployed using a, a browser is actually you can you can deploy it manually. You can get it from here. I'll send it in the chat. Basically open it in Visual Studio, change something if you want to change authentication method. Or you can actually you could probably go directly to the website uh, and change it there. But the point is this source code uh, is available for you to tweak and you can redeploy your site so that it doesn't show a default a logo. You can change everything. You can change colors, add more buttons. And in fact, by looking at their version, the latest like published version, I can see they have more functionality. So the version I deployed is not the latest. Maybe it's just more stable, but they went a little bit further with their implementation. So, yeah, there's actually also a button deploy to Azure here. And by the way, I also want to mention there are some competitors. This is the most basic. There are more advanced ones. Example, this is a second option, Azure Chat. See, it looks a little differently. It's probably hard to see, but it's also chat, also connects to uh, cognitive search. You can also deploy it with one click. And there is another one I tried a couple of months ago. I failed, but they have several examples here. Some of them are quite advanced. Also going to send it in the chat. Also, you can deploy it. They have their own architecture options. That's one of them. In terms of UI, that looks like this. Um, yeah, there are several samples here. I don't know where they put them, but there are several uh, variations of the architecture, depending on how like big your budget is and how complicated you make uh, you want to make it. Uh, also, I want to mention 
the connect uh, the connector to sh SharePoint search uh, to SharePoint is in preview, and I said it might never end up in the release. So what are you? What are your options then? Turns out that a cognitive search loves blob storage already, and it's been going on for years already. So as a workaround, if you're really worried that SharePoint won't be supported long term uh, by cognitive search, OK, you can just upload all of your documents to a blob storage. Ideally with some kind of a script, but you can even drag and drop your files there. And then instead of indexing SharePoint, you you can index the blob storage. And unlike SharePoint data data source, working with the blob storage is supported right now through the web browser. You wouldn't even need necessarily using uh, Postman to send requests to do this part. So maybe it's a bit of a bonus. But I specifically wanted to do this scenario today, which I, I demonstrated. OK, also have a few links I'm sending in the chat. It's mostly everything we talked about today. So if you if you want to get that stuff, it's in the chat, all of these links. Uh, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Kavita. Uh, Naveen, did you have a question? I saw you showed the hand and removed it. <laughs> OK. OK, thanks, uh, everyone. If you want to collaborate if you are interested in practical examples of building something with AI in with your corporate data. If you have a project going on or you're thinking about implementing it, maybe you reach out to me or maybe to Roy. Uh, I think he, Roy might also be interested and we can just share what we learned, how some practical examples and some hurdles. One of the reasons I wanted to show this today is not to advertise using chatbots. I just wanted to honestly show its limitations, to show how expensive it can be, how limited it can be, so that you're not so your expectations are not too high. But you also, if you want something simple, you also will know that you know it's actually doable if i if i'm not um yeah if i if i don't want half a million documents to 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 be used as a data source so yeah re reach out to me if you're mm -hmm. if you have anything yeah yeah no this is awesome dennis uh yeah thanks a lot and uh yeah and um yeah, i'm really excited and i want to try this out too so yeah thank you Thanks, Roy. OK, cool. Um, so yeah, in, in conclusion, um, I'll be doing the next talk next month um, titled like um, just the fundamentals of Azure OpenAI. So I'll show like kind of how to uh, work with the OpenAI with Python and using the embedding models like vectorizing kind of uh, CSV data, you know, in VS Code. So I'll just kind of run through that and uh, go more kind of a deep dive on kind of the API uh, model parameters. Um, so watch out for that. I uh, hope you guys can come up to the talk next week, next month on that, maybe in person. So, OK, cool. Um, yeah, thanks thanks a lot. And uh, everyone, uh, have, a, have a good night. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Roy. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night.